Hello friends, welcome to another module. This module is on the characteristics of good sampling design. Many professions like business, government, engineering, science, social research, agriculture seek the broadest possible factual basis for decision making. In the absence of data on the subject, a decision taken is just like leaping into the dark. Sampling is a procedure wherein a fraction of the data is taken from a large set of data and the inference drawn from the sample is extended to the whole group. Sampling may be defined as the selection of some part of an aggregate or totality on the basis of which a judgment or inference about the aggregate or totality is made. In other words, it is the process of obtaining information about an entire population by examining only a part of it. In most of the research work and surveys, the usual approach happens to be make generalization or to draw inferences based on samples about the parameters of population from which the population are taken. A sample is any number of persons, units or objects selected to represent the population according to some rule or plan. The census method is the enumeration of all the numbers or units of the population to get the idea of the population whereas sampling is the method of selecting a fraction of the population in such a way that it represents the whole population. The objectives of this module would be to visualize the importance of a representative sample and to be able to adopt a good sampling design in a research endeavor. What are the reasons for using sampling in research? Sampling is cheaper than census method, it is economical too. As the magnitude of operation is small in case of sampling, so data collection and analysis can be carried out accurately and efficiently. Sampling is the only way when the population is as large as the population of a country. Sampling enables the researcher to make a precise estimate of the standard error that helps in obtaining information concerning some characteristic of the population. What are the characteristics to identify a good sampling design? We can list the characteristics of a good sampling design as follows. Sampling design must result in a truly representative sample or in other words, the sample size should be large enough to represent the population. Sample design must be such which results in a small sampling error. Sample design must be such that systematic bias can be controlled in a better way. Sample should be such that the results of the sample study can be applied in general for the universe and with a reasonable level of confidence. Sample design must be viable in the context of funds available for the research study. We shall now proceed to see in detail. What is a representative sample? For most survey research, it is impractical in terms of time, budget and other factors to interview everyone in your target population. To get a view of some aspect in the population of country, we do not have to interview everyone in the country. Instead, we can ask a sample for their opinions. As far as possible, the sample of people interviewed should be representative of the target population. To be representative, the characteristics like demographic, attitudinal and behavioral characteristics of people interviewed should be as far as possible match those of the entire target population. As a group, the people interviewed should look no different to those we have not spoken to. Why are representative samples important? Representative samples are important as they ensure that all relevant types of people are included in your sample and that the right mix of people are interviewed. If your sample is not representative, it will be subject to bias. Certain groups may be overrepresented and their opinions magnified while others may be underrepresented. How do we achieve representative samples? 
There are two ways of deriving representative samples for research surveys. Probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Probability or random sampling involves choosing respondents from your target population at random, minimizing potential sample bias. However, to be able to sample randomly, you need to know up-to-date details of everyone in your target population. This is unlikely for many audiences. You also need to be able to actually survey a large proportion of those chosen at random, which can be time consuming and expensive. Samples drawn in this way are more representative than those constructed using non-probability method, but due to the resources needed, this sort of sampling tends to be confined to high quality, well-funded epidemiological, social and government research. Non-probability or purposive sampling is much more widely used. Controls are placed on the types of respondents chosen for the survey in terms of quotas and we specifically look for different types of people to interview to make sure the sample is correctly balanced. In order to set up these quotas, we firstly need to find out the profile of our target population in terms of its key characteristics. For example, if we want to interview a sample of teenagers in the country, we can use census data to find information on the demographic characteristics of this group. We might want to interview the right mix of teenagers by age. If there are fewer 14-year-olds than 18-year-olds in the country, our sample should reflect this. Census data can tell us the number of teenagers of each age as well as gender, region and other useful splits. Once we know the profile of the target population, we can then set quotas on key respondent characteristics. Quotas are typically set on three or four different variables, usually demographic such as gender, age and region. Criteria for selecting a sampling procedure. In this context, one must remember that two costs are involved in a sampling analysis. One, the cost of collecting the data and the cost of an incorrect inference resulting from the data. Researchers may keep in view the two causes of incorrect inferences that is systematic bias and sampling error. A systematic bias results from errors in the sampling procedure and it cannot be reduced or eliminated by increasing the sample size. At best, the causes responsible for these errors can be detected and corrected. Systematic bias Bias in sampling is a systematic error in sampling procedures that leads to a distortion in the results of the study. Improper sampling procedures can introduce bias that result in the sample not being representative of the study population. For example, a study to determine the drug information needs of a rural population and a community drug use intervention failed to give a picture of the health needs of the total population because a nomadic ride which accounted for one third of the total population was left out of the study. There are several possible sources of bias in sampling. The best known source of bias is non-response. In a survey trying to establish how women treat cancer, it was found that many women refused to answer certain questions such as whether they had attended a cancer clinic in the past month. It is possible that these women feared the consequences of disclosing such sensitive information to an outsider. The researchers may therefore not get a realistic picture of the treatment of cancer in the community. Non-response is encountered mainly in studies where people are being interviewed or asked to fill in a questionnaire. They may refuse to be interviewed or forget to fill in the questionnaire. The problem lies in the fact that non-respondents in a sample may exhibit characteristics that differ systematically from the characteristics of the respondent. There are several ways to deal with this problem and reduce the possibility of bias. Data collection tools. Data collection tools including written introductions for the interviewers to use with potential respondents have to be pre-tested. If necessary, adjustments should be made to ensure better cooperation. If non-response is due to absence of the subjects, follow-up of non-respondents may be considered. 
If non-response is due to refusal to cooperate, a few extra questions to non-respondents may be considered to discover to what extent they differ from respondents. Another strategy is to include additional people in the sample so that non-respondents who were absent during data collection can be replaced. However, this can only be justified if their absence was very unlikely to be related to the topic being studied. The bigger the non-response rate, the greater the need to take remedial action. It is important in any study to mention the non-response rate and to discuss honestly whether and how it might have influenced the results. Sample bias will always exist to a certain extent. For example, we cannot force people to complete surveys. Those that do not accept our invitations to participate may well be different in some way to those that take part. For example, the busier people are generally the less likely they are to take part in surveys. Busy people are therefore likely to be underrepresented in research. We cannot therefore eliminate sample bias, but we should do all that we reasonably can to minimize it and to understand it. Usually, a systematic bias is the result of one or more of the following factors inappropriate sampling frame, defective measuring device, non respondent, indeterminacy principle, natural bias in the reporting of data. Next, we come to sampling error. Sampling error are the random variations in the sample estimate around the true population parameter. Since they occur randomly and are equally likely to be in either direction, their nature happens to be of compensatory type and the expected value of such errors happens to be equal to zero. Sampling error decreases with the increase in the size of the sample and it happens to be of a smaller magnitude in case of homogeneous population. Sampling error can be measured for a given sample design and size. The measurement of sampling error is usually called the precision of sampling plan. If we increase the sample size, the precision can be improved. However, increasing the size of the sample has its own limitations. A large size sample increases the cost of collecting data and also enhances the systematic bias. Thus, the effective way to increase precision is usually to select a better sampling design which has a smaller sampling error for a given sample size at a given cost. In practice, however, people prefer a less precise design because it is easier to adopt the same and because of the fact that systematic bias can be controlled in a better way in such a design. In brief, while selecting a sampling procedure, the researcher must ensure that the procedure causes a relatively small sampling error and helps to control the systematic bias in a better way. Next, we come to sample size. One crucial aspect of study design is deciding how big your sample should be. If you increase your sample size, you increase the precision of your estimate, which means that for any given estimate, size of effect, the greater the sample size, the more statistically significant the result will be. In other words, if an investigation is too small, then it will not detect results that are in fact important. Conversely, if a very large sample is used, even tiny deviations from the null hypothesis will be statistically significant, even if these are not in fact practically important. In practice, this means that before carrying out any investigation, you should have an idea of what kind of change from a null hypothesis would be regarded as practically important. The smaller the difference you regard as important to detect the greater the sample size required. Factors such as time, cost and number of subjects actually available are constraints that often have to be taken account of when designing a study. However, these should not dictate the sample size. There is no point in carrying out a study that is too small only to come up with results that are inconclusive since you will then need to carry out another study to confirm or refute your initial results. There are two approaches to sample size calculation. One is the precision based with what precision do you want to estimate the proportion mean difference or whatever it is you are measuring. The other one is power based. How small a difference is important to detect and with what degree of certainty. Level of precision. 
Sample size is to be determined according to some pre-assigned degree of precision. The degree of precision is the margin of permissible error between the estimated value and the population value. In other words, it is the measure of how close an estimate is to the actual characteristics in the population. The level of precision may be termed as sampling error. According to Cochrane, precision desired may be made by giving the amount of error that are willing to tolerate in the sample estimate. The difference between sample statistics and the related population parameter is called the sampling error. It depends on the amount of risk a researcher is willing to accept while using the data to make decisions. It is often expressed in percentage. If the sampling error or margin of error is less or minus 5% and 70% unit in the sample attribute some criteria, then it can be concluded that 65 to 75% of units in the population have attributed that criteria. High level of precision requires large sample sizes and higher cost of and higher cost to achieve these samples. Statistical power. Statistical power is a measure of the likelihood that a researcher will find statistically significance in a sample if the effect exists in the full population. Power is a function of three primary factors and one secondary factor. Sample size, effect size, significance level and the power of the statistics itself. The most common reason to conduct a power analysis is to determine the sample size needed for a particular study. Power is a critically important concept for researchers because the achievement of statistical significance revolves around it. Statistical significance is the research factor that researchers use to determine if an intervention changes an outcome. That determination cannot be achieved with insufficient power. On the other hand, extremely high power might influence a researcher to give more weight to a statistical result than the clinical situation warrants. Effect size Effect size represents the size of the difference between the treated and the untreated groups in a research study. That is, it represents the magnitude of the treatment effect. It is to test for effect size that researchers perform experimental studies. All statistics used to measure treatment effect, that is, all inferential statistics have an associated effect size measure. No researcher should ever report significance without also reporting the effect size. The statistically sophisticated reader can estimate effect size from the sample size and significance level. Significance level or p value. Significance level is the probability cut off usually 0.05 or 5% used. It is chosen in advance of performing the test and the cutoff level depends on how much safeguard is required against accidentally rejecting the null hypothesis when it is in fact true. In hypothesis testing, the significance level is the criterion used for rejecting the null hypothesis. The significance level is used in hypothesis testing as follows. First, the difference between the results of the experiment and the null hypothesis is determined. Then, assuming the null hypothesis is true, the probability of a difference that large or larger is computed. Finally, this probability is compared to the significance level. If the probability is less than or equal to the significance level, then the null hypothesis is rejected and the outcome is said to be statistically significant. Traditionally, experimenters have used either the 0.05 level, sometimes called the 5% level, or the 0.01 level called the 1% level, although the choice of levels is largely subjective. The lower the significance level, the more the data must diverge from the null hypothesis to be significant. Therefore, the 0.01 level is more conservative than the 0.05 level. The Greek letter alpha is sometimes used to indicate the significance level. Confidence level desired. The confidence or risk level is ascertained through the well-established probability model called the normal distribution and an associated theorem called the central limit theorem. 
In general, the normal curve results whenever there are a large number of independent small factors influencing the final outcome. It is for this reason that many practical distributions, be it the distribution of annual rainfall, the weight of birth of babies, the height of individuals and so on are more or less normal if sufficiently large number of items are included in the population. The significance of the normal curve is much more than this. It can be shown that even when the original population is not normal, if we draw samples of n items from it and obtain the distribution of the sample means, we notice that the distribution of the sample means become more and more normal as the sample size increases. The central limit theorem mathematically proves this fact. In conclusion, we have seen that most research work is carried out on a sample and that the sample should be representative of the target population. While selecting a sampling procedure, researchers must ensure that the procedure causes a relatively small sampling error and helps to control the systematic bias in a better way. Sample size should be carefully planned, taking into consideration several factors and particularly the degree of position, the degree of precision and the level of confidence desired in the study results.